Dutch stranger I'm traveling through This wearisome land I've got a home in That yonder city Good Lord, and it's not Lord, will it's not. not made by hand I've got a father Mother and some brothers Who have gone This way before I am determined to go and see them, good Lord, for there, on that other shore, I am a pilgrim and a stranger, I'm traveling through this troublesome land, but I've got a home in that yonder city, good Lord, and it's not by hand I'm going down to the river of Jordan just to bathe my wearisome soul and if I can just touch the hem of his garment good Lord I know that he'll make me whole I am a pilgrim and a stranger I'm traveling through this troublesome land I've got a home in that wonderful city And good Lord I know it's not made by hand I am a pilgrim and a stranger I'm traveling through this troublesome land And I've got a home in that wonderful city Good Lord, and I know, Lord, well, I know it's not made by hand. I've got a home in that wonderful city. The good Lord, I know, Lord, well, I know it's not made by hand. Jericho, 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 Josh picked the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. Well, Josh picked the battle of Jericho, 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 Josh picked the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. Good morning, Sister Mary. Good morning, Brother John. Well, I want to stop and talk with you, want to tell you how I come along. I know you heard about Joshua, he was the son of none. He never stopped his work until, until his work was done. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. You may talk about the men of Gideon, you may brag about your king of Saul, but there's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Up to the walls of Jericho they march with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, comes the battle's in my hand. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. You may talk about the men of Gideon, you may brag about your king of Saul, but there's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Well, they tell the great God that Joshua's spear was well nigh twelve feet long. And upon his hip was a double-edged sword, and his mouth was a gospel horn. Yet bold and brave he stood, salvation in his hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the devil can't do you no harm. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. Up to the walls of Jericho he marched with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle's in my hand. Then the lamb ram sheep horns begin to blow, the trumpets begin to sound. Oh, Joshua shouted, glory, and the walls came tumbling down. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. I've got 
got my backup singers for the next project. Good to see everybody tonight. We're grateful to have you on this um, Friday night, the uh, 25th day of October. We're here in Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, we're grateful we're in a uh, fellowship hall here. And uh, Pastor Moses, we want to thank you and your wife publicly for hosting us uh, tonight, my friend. May the Lord bless you for your graciousness. And uh, we've got some more to talk about as it relates to the church later. But uh, tonight... We're going to be talking, uh, dealing with the um, mystery of iniquity for about an hour and get everybody home at a decent hour. And I want to just, uh, we've already mentioned it to the people here, uh, but uh, let me just say it to you folks. We'll be back here tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and 5 o'clock uh, tomorrow evening we'll be having uh, communion. And um, I just want to say that um, we will have, um, we're going to get you out of here by dark tomorrow night. <laughs> When you're coming into Salem and Federal Street, we're on the side. So when you come onto Federal and you turn off the Federal off of um, uh, Maple Street or what was the street? St. Paul? Yeah, oh, St. Peter. St. Peter, St. Peter Street. Uh, and you turn to Federal, we're around the side. And um, the, the awning got us two more folks here tonight. So we're going to do a uh, we're going to do a. Um, another scope tonight about that and, and talk about that. But we're grateful all of you that are listening to us are here. We're grateful y'all are here tonight. Um, I want to just share a few things with you because it is uh, 7.45 already and we're starting a little late and I don't want to keep you out here too late tonight on this cold night and get you home so I can get you back here in the morning. Uh, we're going to have a good day tomorrow and um, we're going to be dealing in the morning with uh, Israel and the land, but we're going to do it in lieu of uh, God's plan for Israel and the Middle East. And we're going to literally deal with how God is going to reconcile um, the, all of the factions that you see fighting in the Middle East tonight. Uh, and there's a verse in Isaiah where he talks about Egypt, Assyria, and Israel all being a blessing in the land. And we know tonight they're not a blessing in the land. They're killing each other. <laughs> Trying to at least. Um, but Israel is one day going to be restored to God, and Israel is going to not only be a blessing herself, she's going to be restored to the top nation on the earth, but God, in doing so, he's not, he's not forgotten the Arab world either, and he is going to address the Arab world, and they're going to be brought back to him as well, and that's a promise out of God's word, and we're going to talk about that. Um, Tonight, I'm dealing more a little bit with the church. Um, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to deal with the church again because we're going to deal with the anti-Semitism that has really become a very, very ugly stain on the church, and it's not just recent. I know a lot of people think a lot of this stuff that you're hearing is recent. It really goes way back to the church fathers, and we're going to deal with that. You're going to have a handout, and you're going to probably be a little shocked at some of the things that you, you'll read. Now, if you've been watching us on these past conferences, we've talked about it. We didn't really do it much uh, in Dalton this last time because we were dealing with something else, but um, we've covered it, but every city's different, and I know tomorrow will be different here, and whatever we do, it'll be something just for Salem tomorrow. Tomorrow night, we're going to address witchcraft and evil spirits, demon spirits, and we're going to talk a lot about how they are tied to the end time narrative and how they're driving a lot of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to talk about the spirits behind them tomorrow night because um, we are literally living in the end times. Are we in agreement tonight here that we're in the end times? I mean, we believe that we are. Um, I think that that is one of the um, biggest things that I see out there that people don't really grasp of the lateness of the hour that we're in. Uh, there are certain segments of the church tonight that they are, um, I don't know if it's deliberate, I don't know if it's just ignorance, I don't know if it's um, uh, maybe a lack of teaching because people don't teach on Bible prophecy anymore, people don't teach on Israel, people don't, they, they're scared of the end times. But I'm going to say this about this tonight, the New Testament, this is my New Testament tonight we're going to be teaching out of, Two-thirds, two-thirds of the New Testament and three-fifths of the Bible is related to Bible prophecy. It's related to events that are yet to come. 
The other third deals with basically the creation of man, the fall of man, and the redemption of man. That is the ultimate theme of the Bible. But within that theme, there are other themes that the Holy Spirit has laid out for us from Genesis to Revelation. One of those things is the nation of Israel. One of those themes is the fact that Israel was called out by God. She was called as a nation, chosen as a nation. Uh, she was to be his witness on the earth in the Old Covenant. Uh, when God sent her, or the events, I shouldn't say he sent her, but let's just say that when um, Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, he had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob. And when Jacob had a little wrestling match at a ladder one night, um, he lost that wrestling match, by the way. Uh, he lost it badly. I put it like this. Jacob lost that wrestling match so bad that his name got changed. And that's pretty bad. Um, but he got his name changed that night to Israel, a prince with God. And before that, Jacob's name meant surplanter. It meant a fraud. It meant a cheat. And the night that God touched him, and he, you know, Abraham told the Lord that night when he grabbed the angel, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And that word in the Hebrew literally means until you change me. Jacob got desperate. He wanted to be changed. And let me just say this tonight. This ain't the subject matter, but I will say it. When God gets a hold of us, if God don't change it, then it ain't God that's got a hold of us. Because God don't do no half jobs. Because when God changes you, He changes you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and God, and, and let me say this about our nation, and I'm going to say this about this city. We're, we're not in Peabody tonight. We're in downtown Salem, Massachusetts. And just driving in tonight, and I know all of you saw it, I saw it. There were people in witch outfits, warlock outfits, demons, ghouls, uh, goblins. You had children in that costumes. You had people dressed up with horror characters just walking down the street, and they were just happy, and, and this city celebrates evil. There ain't no, way to, there ain't no other way to say it. They celebrate Satan. But I'm going to tell you something. The power of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God can change Salem, Massachusetts. Amen? Amen. Amen. If, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have driven 980 miles to tell you that tonight. I don't know what it is about this city, but I've had, uh, there's been such a burden on this city since October of 2022. I have never probably shared this publicly. Maybe I should. Um, I was doing a crusade in another state, and I was walking out of the church, and this was, it had to have been a week or less to Halloween, because I remember calling Catherine. I was driving home from that state, and I, I, and I knew Catherine had been in the show, and I'd seen her one night, and I saw her say, I'm from Salem. I'm from Massachusetts, and the Lord laid her on my heart at the same time, and he said, I want you to call Catherine. I want you to find out. If uh, I want you to tell her what you want to do, what I want you to do, I want you to go to Salem and do one of these crusades there in two weeks. And I said, Lord, we don't have a place. I don't know a soul in Salem. And I said, I don't know if Catherine, he should probably laugh me off the phone. Are you kidding me? You're talking to get me, have you do, have me do this in two weeks? Are you nuts? Which at that point, Catherine was still listening to the show. She knew I was already nuts, so it's all right. <laughs> like everybody else who listens to the Mac Files, it's all right. But I, I, I told her on the phone, I said, Catherine, I feel the Lord wanting us to come to Salem, Massachusetts. And um, it was so miraculous what happened within a matter of, I guess, 48 hours. Um, you called me back that evening or Tuesday and said, Chris, we got a place. I got you a place. It was very reasonable. And the miracle was the weekend we wanted it was Halloween weekend. And the hotel rate was triple what the conference room was. I mean, those rooms were rent for 12,000, uh, 12, 1,200, 600 a night. And that's why Chris didn't stay here. Chris stayed <laughs> 35, 40 miles away. But uh, I remember that drive going home. And when she told me we had a place, I knew God was saying, it's for you to go. Now, I used to travel quite a bit. I was a photographer. I traveled the country for many years. Uh, the travel didn't bother me. Uh, but I will tell you all this tonight. 
and it happened in the spring of last of 23 as well. I had never experienced such warfare getting to a city. And after I left the city than I did that first time, the second time it was even worse. But there was something about this trip tonight and yesterday, and I was telling Mary and Catherine this, um, it's 980 miles. That's not a that's not a little skip and a jump from my house. Um, it felt like, and I am not exaggerating, it felt like that I was here in 15 minutes and that, over a two-day trip. The power and the presence of God was just so, so sweet in my car. And I have never had, we had no traffic except one little boo-boo last night. That was a miracle. It was a tractor trailer overturned in Virginia. And the Lord provided a way immediately when it happened. And I was just in the right place at the right time that I was able to backtrack just 10 miles. All I had to go back, circle around, and come over above the uh, wreck 10 miles out without having to backtrack 100 miles. It was amazing because the traffic was backed up 20, 30 miles back. And there was no, even when I left, there was a young lady that walked by and I said, what's going up there? She said, that truck is turned upside down and there's nobody coming to, there's nobody coming to get it. So we're going to be here a while. And uh, the Lord had provided a side road. I saw it and he said, take that road and go back. And I did. And the rest is history. I rested well last night. But even, even coming up here tonight, um, even coming up here tonight, I I felt, or this afternoon, there was such a sweet presence, and I was here just like that. Even the trip into Salem, I rode with Catherine into here before, and I can tell you, it's a nightmare. And all I could think about tonight is, Lord, it's just Halloween. Nobody's going to come because they're going to be scared of the traffic. And I said, we're going to be, um, you know, in, in the heart of town. There's going to be everybody out. And the devil, you know how the devil speaks to you. I know the devil don't speak to none of y'all, but he 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 tries to get in my head sometimes. And he was telling me, he said, "You just don't need to worry about this. You don't even need to do this this weekend. Why are you up here? Why are you even up here? It's gonna nobody's coming." And um, and then when I got here, we the trip was not as bad as I thought. The parking was available, and thank God to my friends, they said that when you got on live at at six. We saw the awning, and we knew where you was at. Helped us find us. So we got a good crowd here tonight, and we're going to be here tomorrow. But I wanted to tell you this. I'm not telling you this for any other reason but this. I don't know why the Lord has put this city on my heart. It's my third trip here. And I just feel like that the Lord wants me to come up here every year and do something like this, like we're doing tonight. We've changed the format of the Crusades since we saw you last. A lot of things have changed, um, and we're we're much better for it. And there has been a um, a shaking and a a change in the wind. But I have never been more clear as to my path going ahead and going forward than I am tonight. And I know that this city is included in that. I know that the Lord wants me to come up here, and it may be twice a year. I don't know. It's a miracle, and she'll tell you, get in the room like we got back, the, the conference room that weekend, for it to be available, because that, that conference room was not available this weekend. It was, and, and it was, and it was, nothing was available in Salem at all, even in Peabody this weekend. And Pastor Moses stepped up and told Mary that we could use this facility, and I'm grateful to him tonight. So I know I'm supposed to be here, and the Lord's provided. And I was praying in tongues out in the parking lot before we got started. And I felt the wind start blowing. Now, I wasn't sure if the wind blowing was the devil telling me, I know you're here, God telling me it's, you're going to freeze and not put your jacket on before you catch a cold. <laughs> but whether it was the devil or God, I'm going to give God the credit. I think it was the Lord's reminder that I just needed to put a coat on because it's a little chilly up here in Salem, Massachusetts tonight. Now, I said all that to get you to this. We're in the end times, folks. The warfare over cities and the warfare over nations, the warfare that you see and experience in this town, the things that the church is going through right now, the apostasy that you see happening, the false doctrine that you hear being taught, the uh, falling away, the falling away that has taken place. Um, our nation... Look, as we do this, we're in uh, October the 25th tonight. We're just one week, uh, one week and four days away from the most crucial, most prophetic, most, I, I think, I, I can't even 
overstate the importance of what we're all about to do a week from this past Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. well, we've got to go vote. And this country is at a diametrically crossroads that it has never been at in any election. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that people want to they tend to look at the candidates. I don't look at the candidates. I look at the spirit behind them. Because the spirits behind them are representing two different directions for our nation. They are, we're either going to move closer to God and enjoy freedom. The church, I'm speaking of the church tonight. Or we're going to forfeit what we already have, which is, look, our freedoms are already slipping from us. I mean, look, let's just face it, folks. Even even in the last year and a half, I, you know, we came here October 22. This is this two years ago when I first met you guys. Mm -hmm. So it's been two years. Even in the 24 months since we first stepped into Salem, our nation has taken a direct turn so bad it is not funny. And I thought in 22 things were pretty rough. But we are, we've never seen this stuff. And I think that's one of the reasons why the evil that you see displayed in these cities is getting more rampant and more open. And, and there's no fear. There's no fear of God because there's no fear of God in our government. There's no fear in our upper leadership. But let me tell you what's worse. There's no fear of God in the church. There's no fear and there's no understanding of the days we're living in. And if the church don't understand what time we're living in, I can tell you that world ain't going to understand what time we're living in either. Now, I want that's my introduction. I want to talk to you a little bit about the church at Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul laid out something in the first and the second letter that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. The first letter he wrote had to do with the Christian faith. I want to tell you a little bit about Thessalonica. They were a church that was under great persecution. Um, they were under great distress financially. Uh, Paul founded that church. He helped build that church. He had he had basically given his life to make sure that church was grounded on sound doctrine. And what he did in writing these two letters, the first letter he wrote outlined the rapture of the church. Now, I want you to write this down if you got notes tonight. We're going to read. I want, to, I want you to turn in your Bibles first. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians first. I want to read 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, and then we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's where we're going to be tonight. And I may just read these verses to you, and i got to get my glasses out to do it. But um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want to um, say a few things about, before we read this, I want to say a few things about the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord. There are two comings. When you say the second coming of Jesus, it involves two events. The first event is for the church. I know that the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the doctrine of the rapture is. And if you can understand this tonight, it's very important. And you, I would write this down. The rapture and the resurrection of the saints are the same thing. When you read Paul's words to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, he speaks of the fact that there is coming, if Jesus was raised from the dead, then we that are his are also going to be raised from the dead too. How many of you got loved ones that have died and went on to be with Jesus? I've got plenty. I know all of you do. Uh, listen to me. If, if they are not going to be raised from the dead, Paul said we're men most miserable. Like if they died without hope, if they died and there's no hope of a resurrection, then why, why are we even doing this? Why am I even here tonight? I mean, we might as well just throw the towel in and say, well, you know, we ain't going to be resurrected anyway, and whatever. And, and what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians, that if, if Christ died and rose again, then we which are in Christ, we're going to also be raised from the dead as well. Now, when we say this, you got to understand, there are going to be some, when this event takes place, that are already in the grave. They're in Christ. The dead in Christ shall rise. But there are going to be some on this earth that at whenever that moment occurs, 
they're going to be alive. And that, I think, is where the church gets its confusion from because when you talk about the rapture and you talk about the second coming, all people think about, well, you're just talking about people escaping off this earth and being caught up. And, and you know, they're just going to be snatched away. And you Christians that believe that, y'all don't want to, you know, do anything and harvest, get in the harvest field. That's absolutely false, folks. Let me tell you something. I'll say this to you tonight without blinking. A person that truly believes in the rapture, they're going to be the most busiest Christian in the world. They're going to be the most dedicated Christian in the world. They're going to be the Christian that's dedicated to the harvest more than any other Christian you're ever going to find. They're not looking to escape. I tell you what they're looking to do. They're looking to get as many people on this ark as they can before that great day comes. Amen? And Jesus himself said, he said, Pray ye therefore always that you may be accounted worthy to escape. And if you want to call it an escape thing, fine, call it that. Jesus called it that. He said you need to pray that you're worthy to escape the things that are coming upon the earth. Now, we talked about the things that were coming upon the earth in Dalton, Ohio, the first uh, conference we did up there in June. We're not going to have time to do that this weekend. But the Great Tribulation is what Christ was referring to that will take place after the resurrection of the saints or the rapture. I, I might as well say this. Um, when I get comments sent to me about the rapture and people just just knock and just make all sorts of slurs and and all you're preaching you're preaching escapism you're preaching you're you're convincing people not to to work for god and you're convincing people that uh of a false hope and you're convincing people that they're going to not have to face the Antichrist and face the tribulation. Can I ask y'all a blunt question tonight? Is there anybody in this room that even wants to face the Antichrist? No. Is there anybody want to be left behind? I literally had somebody tell me one time, they said, I think the Lord's, Lord's ordained me to stay behind and fight the Antichrist. And I said, no, the Lord ain't ordained you to do that. The Lord's ordained you to go get spiritual help. That's what he's ordained you to do. No, the Lord's ordained you to get help, mental and spiritual. Because he ain't ordained us to fight the Antichrist. No, he wants us to be ready at any moment. I want to say a couple of things about the rapture, and this will help you. A couple of little nuggets, and I can call them nuggets. Um, one of the worst things you can do, and I can do, is try to figure out dates. If anybody, I don't care who it is, that's the other knock that we as rapture people get. They say, well, y'all are setting dates. Y'all say he's coming soon, and you don't know he's coming soon. You know something? I'm going to actually give them that argument. Can I tell you something tonight? They don't know he's not coming soon. Amen? Even the people that tell you that, they're setting a date. If they're telling you, I've seen people say that. They're saying, well, if Christ is coming back in 100 years, then what are we supposed to do? I tell you what we do. We occupy till he comes. And Christ may be back in 100 years, but Christ may be back before we finish this conference this weekend. I may be joining y'all in the clouds. I may be worshiping with y'all at heaven. I, we, may be, we may be starting tonight and finishing up tomorrow night before we get out of here. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I bet them witches, can y'all imagine if we were standing on the streets of Salem and we disappeared in front of all these witches up here in Salem? They probably think that their spells had, had caused us to go away. They probably would think that they had finally got rid of all the Christians. We, we made them poof. I can see the witches. I can see the witches holding their convention right now. Well, there's a bunch of Christians who are walking down Salem witnessing to us and they were just poofed out of the way. We got them out of here. But folks, I know y'all are laughing at that, but that's the mentality of many even in the church. They don't believe it. They don't believe Jesus is coming. They don't believe Jesus is coming again. They don't even believe. And then, you know, you've got some, and I'm not going to argue semantics with these folks. You know, they're saying, well, it's the mid-trib or the post-trib. Folks, let me tell you this. If you are looking for Jesus to come, you're not appointed to wrath. You're not appointed to go through that period of time. The resurrection is for the saints. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. There's only two resurrections. Write this down on your notes tonight. There are only two resurrections mentioned in Scripture. The resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the damned. The resurrection of the just is called the rapture. It's called the catching up. The gathering up of the saints. Um, John saw a he heard a voice in Revelation four, and it, he heard a trumpet, and that and he heard he looked up to heaven and he heard that voice. that said, "Come up hither." And I jokingly said this the other night. I said, "If you don't want to call it the rapture, then I got a new name for you. It's the coming up hitherer." 
How about that? Yeah. It's the coming up hither. Because that's the same thing. It's the same thing. Amen. And I don't know what mental block Christians have about this. I've been told myself, well, uh, all, you, all you rapture people are, again, wanting to escape. You're wanting a great escape clause. You don't want to fight anything. What are we going to fight, folks? I'm going to tell you this. And I talked about this back in August in Dalton, and this is important to understand. And hear me good. The church itself, now hear me carefully or you'll miss what I'm saying. The church itself in its own strength cannot change this world. The church in itself, even in Salem, cannot change Salem. As bad as this earth is tonight, as, as bad as things are, the only hope, the only hope, the only hope this world has tonight is one thing. And it's really two things were into one. First of all, it's Christ and Him crucified. But everything that this world is going through tonight, everything this earth is going through, everything this precious city is going through, do you know what's going to change Salem? Do you know what's, when this witchcraft and all this evil is going to end? When Jesus Christ comes back? I want to say it again. Do you know when all the AIDS on the earth is going to end? When Jesus Christ comes back? You want to know when all the corruption in government's going to end? When Jesus Christ comes back? You know when all the poverty is going to end? When Jesus Christ comes back? You, know, you, know when, you don't want to know when all the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the hurricanes and, and all, the, all the earth shaking like a leaf tonight is going to stop when Jesus Christ comes back? Glory to God tonight. You, know, you, you want to know when the end of the church's false teaching and the doctrine and all this doctrinal mess that everybody's in and the failure of people and, and, and people falling and the church being destroyed and all this stuff that's going on? Let me tell you what's going to happen, neighbor. The, the only thing that can save us from ourselves in the church is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God tonight. Glory to God tonight. He's coming for the church. He's coming for the church. And seven years later, he's coming with the church. He's coming with the church. Now, there are several things. I will say this about time. We don't know, and we never will know, the exact date or hour that he's coming for the church. There is indications that there's a seven-year period. There's scriptures. Daniel calls it his 70th week in Daniel chapter 9 that between the first coming and the second coming, there's a seven-year period, and that's what's called the Great Tribulation period. The Antichrist will be revealed after the rapture. I'm going to read that to you tonight if I can never get to my scripture. But understand, God is not scared of setting dates. God's dates are in place in heaven. Where we get in trouble as humans is we try to tamper with what the Bible says. There's a lot of verses in here that have to do with the dates. There are a lot of verses. Excuse me, I got my screen messed up here. There's a lot of verses. There's a lot of verses in this Bible that have dates attached to them. He told Israel, he said, you're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. Israel tried to wiggle out of that. Israel tried to, their false prophets told Israel that's not true. God had set in stone 70 years. And guess how many years Israel was in Babylon? You got it, 70 years. He told Noah, he said, I want you to stay in that ark for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm going to bring rain on the earth. Guess what happened? He didn't rain on the earth for 35 nights and days. What did he do? He rained the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. He, Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going to die. And in how many days? In three days, I'm going to rise again. Jesus didn't rise again in four days or five days. He rose again the third day, just like he said. And if the Bible tells us that there's a 70th week or seven, it's a week is seven years. And we're waiting on the beginning of that 70th week in Daniel. Then I can guarantee you tonight without hesitation, it's going to be seven years. 
And nothing man can do can change that. You can't pray it away. You can't intercede it away. You can't stop it. The, the church can't stop it. The UN can't stop it. America can't stop it. Backslidden preachers can't stop it. False prophets can't stop it. I don't care how many people are prophesying to you tonight that the world's going to get better, 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 better. The earth's not getting better, better, better. Folks, can I ask you a question? The church has been on this earth for 2,000 years preaching the gospel. Has we Have we made a dent in the evil in 2,000 years tonight? No. If you think, if you really think about the, the condition of the earth itself, with all the gospel preaching, with all the wonderful preachers of the past, with all the wonderful evangelists of the past, with all the wonderful millions of people that have come to Christ with all sincerity, even with the billions of people that know Christ tonight, the earth itself is still evil, isn't it? That should tell us that the church in itself cannot solve the world's problems. The church needs Jesus, the head of the church, to come back tonight. Glory to God. 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 And if the church could have fixed the earth, the church already would have. But this is why what I'm telling you tonight is so important. The Apostle Paul called it the gathering together and the catching up of the saints. Titus called it the blessed hope. Paul called it the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. It is the resurrection of the saints. And it's going to be twofold. It is going to be both the dead in Christ and it is going to be those which are alive and remain at that moment. i got to say something to you all and I hate to bust your bubble. I hate to give you bad news. A majority of us, if the Lord tarries any length of time, are going to be on the dead in Christ side. It, we just are. Um, I'll share a little quick story with you. You may have heard me share it before. Um, I was driving down one day with my dad in the car. Uh, and I think we may have actually been sitting on a porch before he died. And I said, Dad, I said, what's the most, what's the most wonderful thing that you are hoping for as you near the end here? What's the, what's the one thing that you really are praying for as you get to the end? And my dad didn't hesitate. One of the things he said made me tear up. And the other one, I teared up too. He looked at me without hesitation. He said this to me in the car. He said, Chris, he said, um, I only pray to God every day that you, Todd, and John, which is his three sons and Jennifer, my sister, do not precede me in death. He said, I, I cannot stomach the thought of having to bury one of you before I go. He said, that's not how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to precede y'all in death. And I said, I understand that, Dad. I understand that. And I started weeping because I felt the same way about my own children. I don't want to see any of them that have to go before me. I, would, I want God to take me first. That's how it's supposed to be. But the second thing he told me, and he said, Chris, he said, the only thing I've really asked the Lord, he said, is that when that trump sounds, that I'm on this side of the grave and not in the ground. Now, my dad didn't get to see that second part. He got to see the first part because he didn't. none of his boys died before he died. But let me tell you this tonight. He's waiting for the same trumpet that I'm waiting for tonight. Amen. He is waiting for the same blessed hope. He is in heaven tonight waiting for that trump to sound. But the dead in Christ, listen, they're in heaven. They're, they're, they're in heaven without a doubt. But they've not received their glorified bodies yet. They are spirit. They are in the heavens in the spirit form. But they're waiting for that trumpet, just like we're waiting for it. Why? Because the resurrection, they're going to be changed. Oh! Oh, oh, oh! I see Pastor Moses has got the same thing I got. We got to wear glasses because we can't see past our nose. He's got gray hair like I got. My dear buddy right here, he's ain't got no hair at all. But I tell you what, when that trump sounds, he's going to get hair. When that trump sounds, these glasses are going to fall off. Chris is going to be good looking when that trump sounds. Can somebody say amen tonight? Amen. 
When you get up in the morning and those bones ache and you can't even get out of bed because those bones are aching. Let me tell you when the trump of God sounds, we ain't going to ache no more. Some of you are sick. Pastor Moses is in a chair tonight. Let me tell you, neighbor, he's going to walk. He is going to walk. He is going to walk. He is going to walk in glory. There is not going to be any cripple at the trumpet. There's not going to be any death at the trumpet. There ain't going to be any blind at the trumpet. There ain't going to be any sickness when that trump sounds. Immortality. Mortality will put on immortality. Corruption will put on incorruption. <laughs> Glory to God. That's why it's called a blessed hope. And it is the hope of those that have went before us. It is the hope of those that have went before us. It is our hope tonight. It's a blessed hope. And I want to say it again, neighbor. If, if we're a true child of God, there's nobody I've ever known that believes in the rapture that's sitting around twiddling their thumbs, eating Twinkies and saying, well, I'm just waiting for the rapture to take me out of here. I've never met anybody like that. I, I just never met anybody like that. No, people that believe in the rapture, I'm concerned tonight, folks. Look, I'm concerned about these laws. I, 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 my, my heart, the Lord squeezed my heart tonight as I got out of that car coming in here. And I, I didn't even cry this much the first time I came here. But there was something about tonight. I'm telling you, something, the Lord gave me another, just a burden, a heavy burden for this city again. And I started weeping, weeping over the, and I just, and I saw a young lady walking by in a witch's outfit and her kids were dressed up and there was another couple of people I saw coming into town and they, I just saw them in my mind and I, and I said, Lord, I said, please save these people, please save them, save them. This, this city is so evil, it's, it's, it's ramping up the evil, they're, they're blaspheming you every time we turn around. I remember when Catherine and and Mary took us downtown that first, that, it was Halloween weekend. And it was a Saturday afternoon before that Saturday night service. And we walked into that market. And I have never in my life, folks, never seen the rampant Satanism and the rampant witchcraft and the rampant blasphemy of God. I mean, just blasphemous stuff in a city. And I think to myself, Lord, time is short. Time is short. Time is short. Time is short. Now, it's 8.20. Can you give me 20 more minutes? I'll get you out here at 8.40. With the help of God. Now, the biggest question that people in their mind try to figure out, and it's really as simple as what the scriptures tell you, um, I get asked the question a lot. One of the biggest questions I got to answer, and we're going to answer this question sort of this weekend because tomorrow morning especially we're going to deal with America and how she plays into Bible prophecy too, not just Israel. But probably two or three of the biggest questions I get asked is, is the church going through the tribulation? Number two, I'm asked, where's America going to be? Is America going to survive any of this? You know, where are we going to be in all this? Um, Number three, um, is the Antichrist going to be, are we going to know who the Antichrist is before we're raptured out? I want to answer that last question first. I believe that the Bible tells us that we will not know who he is. And I'll tell you why. I want you to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. I've sort of given you the summary of 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4. Let me just go ahead and do this. Let me read 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Let's just read this together real quick. Um, and it says, thank you, my friend. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, verse 13, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That refers to people that have died. Mm -hmm. That refers to people that have died. That's your loved ones tonight. By the way, I might as well, can I meddle? Y'all like to hear that word. When I start meddling, I get myself in so much trouble. Can I meddle for the first time? Do you realize that this term, I don't want you to be ignorant, he only says that about three things. Israel, spiritual gifts, and the rapture. That's the only time the Holy Spirit had Paul tell the church, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. The question must be asked tonight, why is people ignorant? It's pretty simple. They don't read this little book right here. And if they do read it, they don't believe it. That's the other thing I'm realizing. There's people that read this book. 
There's people that read this. They know what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4. They know what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. They know what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. They know what Jesus said in Luke. They know what Jesus said in Matthew 24. They read it. They stare at it. I don't care what he said. I still don't believe in the rapture. I still don't believe he's coming back. Let me tell you something. You can read it till you're blue in the face. It's whether you believe it or not that matters tonight. Because there's a lot of Christians that are doing just that. You know, it's funny. I heard a pastor say this years ago, and God, he was so right. Do you realize that if you stare directly into the sun, it'll blind you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But if you don't stare directly into the sun and you allow the sun to guide you, 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 you can't see without it. Mm-hmm. It's dark out there tonight. You walk out there without mm-hmm. no natural light. We didn't have street lights. We'd, we'd, we'd stumble in the dark, wouldn't mm-hmm. we? Yes. But you know what? The other thing that causes blindness is the fact that if you stare in that sun straight on, it will it will cause damage to your eyes. You can't see, can you? It just it's what happened to Paul. It, it's what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road. The, the the Lord struck him down with a blind light, and Paul just fell to the ground. Can I tell you something tonight? That's a lot of what Christians are basically controlled by false doctrine. They stare. They stare at this book. That's all they do. They stare. But they don't walk in it. If you walk in that sunlight, you're going to see, right? If you stare at it, you're going to go blind. And that's the state as it relates to end time prophecy. Folks, I'm going to tell you this tonight. Now, you're going to hear me say this a lot this week. We should not be intimidated by the study of end time events. If two thirds of the Bible is prophecy, or two thirds of the New Testament is prophecy, if three-fifths of the Bible is prophecy. I think that sort of gives us an idea that God wants us to understand this. And if he says, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of this, then what he's telling you, that what he's about to tell you is to keep you out of spiritual ignorance. Correct? Now, let me say this, and I'm not saying this to you all tonight, but I'm, this is being recorded, but I am saying this to my audience. There's two kinds of ignorance, folks, and both are very dangerous. But the second one is far worse than the first. The first kind of ignorance is somebody that really is sincere. But for whatever reason, and a lot of this may be they've been in churches that just didn't teach it. They've been around people that don't understand it. They've probably outsourced their theology, not to the Bible, but they've outsourced their theology to YouTube, and that's a dangerous thing to do. They've outsourced their their theology to Telegram. They've outsourced their theology to Twitter. But deep down in their heart, deep down in the resources of their heart, they want to know. They want the truth, but they're, sometimes they'll, it had taken months. And folks, I've been studying prophecies since I've been a, a 12-year-old boy in Atlanta, Georgia. I love prophecy. My dad was a prophecy teacher. He loved teaching prophecy on Wednesday night, and I sit on that front row, and I gobbled it up. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm going to turn 60 in about three months. I am still learning. I am still learning. There are things that I'm learning on this morning Bible study that I'm teaching that it's like I've, I've read for years, and it's just like the Holy Spirit just pops a light bulb on, and you're like, goodness, it's right there. And I've learned just like that because it was a blind spot for years. And there's, all of us are in that boat. We read things forever, ever, ever, and we read it, read it, read it, read it. And all of a sudden, we read it one day, and the Holy Spirit just take a two-by-four and hit us right upside the head and say, oh, and you say, oh, I get it, I get it. But in the sense of that, before that happens, we're ignorant of that Bible truth. You follow me? That ignorance can be fixed. That ignorance can be fixed. And again, I hate to use that term, but that's what Paul is using here. The other kind of ignorance is dangerous. And it's called willful ignorance. Let me tell you what willful ignorance is. Willful ignorance is you can tell somebody that this is true. You can tell somebody that the rapture is true. You can tell somebody that Jesus is coming. You can tell somebody that the tribulation is coming. You can tell somebody that, hey, there's a man of sin that's about to come on the earth and he's going to plunge this world into unspeakable evil. I'll just make it even stop. I won't even talk about the end times. You can tell somebody there's a heaven and a hell. You can tell somebody that Jesus is the only way to heaven. You can tell somebody that the Bible is the only truth you need. You can tell somebody that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit, Jesus delivers, and Jesus is coming again. You can do that till you're blue in the face. And they will acquiesce with their mind. But again, but again, they don't believe it. And they are willfully ignorant 
of these things because they want to be. They want to be. And that kind of ignorance, I'm going to tell you this, that can't be fixed. That cannot be fixed except by one thing, the Holy Spirit. I'm fine. Thank you all. The Holy Spirit breaking forth into that person's heart and that person's mind and enlightening them, and they have to believe. Amen? What does the Bible tell us in Romans 10 tonight? Faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. You can hear with your ears, but if you don't hear with your heart, you're not going to get it. There's a lot of people that hear with their ears. By the way, just a little Bible nugget. God gave us two of these and one of these. I'll just leave. I'll leave that alone tonight. That's that's for another. That's for another city for another time. That's what my dad used to tell me. Clean out your ears, boy. Clean out your ears. God gave you two of these and one in your mouth. Stop talking. Stop running your mouth and listen. He'd listen. Daddy said a lot of daddyisms that I can't repeat sometimes, but uh, that was one of my favorites. And it'll all come out in the wash. That was another one Daddy used to say. It's all going to come out in the wash. Don't worry about it. Stop worrying about anything. It's all going to come out in the wash. It's all going to come out in the wash. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you about this wash, though. It's coming out under the blood-stained banner of the cross, neighbor. It's going to come out all right, but it's coming out through the blood of Jesus tonight. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Now, Paul is telling this church at Thessalonians, I don't want you to be ignorant. And he goes through the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th, and the 18th chapters. And he literally tells them, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Let me say it again, folks. The rapture and the resurrection are the same. He ain't coming back to this planet by himself. Now, you might want to write this down because I've, I've heard somebody say this. And they made a mockery of the rapture one night, and they were mocking it bad. And the, the way he taught this, he said, well, what's the purpose for Christ coming back to the earth two times? Let me tell you something. He's not coming back to the earth two times. He's coming back in the clouds in the rapture. He's not going to come back physically to the earth for the church. He's not coming and stepping foot in Jerusalem at the rapture. He's going to come into the clouds. And he's going to bring the dead with him. Who's What's he meaning the dead? The dead spirits. The spirits of those that have departed. The dead in Christ. He's bringing them with us. Why is he bringing them with us? I tell you what he's bringing them for. They're about to get their glorified bodies because them bodies are coming out of that grave. I don't know where it was when I saw this big old graveyard coming into Salem tonight and I thought to myself two things. I said I would not want to be in this graveyard on Halloween night watching these witches do some of this ugly evil at that graveyard. But I tell you the other thought I had, I said, won't it be a just a jolt in the old system for these witches to be out there doing that crap by night and the trump of God sound and the dead in Christ coming out of the grave? Ho 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 I bet that'll get their attention. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. That's who he's coming back with. He's coming back with us. He's coming back with the dead in Christ. But if you are alive at that moment, and see, that's what we don't know, whether we're going to be dead or alive, we don't know. And we don't know who's going to be here and who ain't, because we don't know when it's going to happen. They will also be translated. Then we will meet him in the clouds. But if he's, if what Paul was saying to this church, folks, if Christ died and rose again, He's going to bring those who have died with him and they're going to come out of that grave just like he did. Amen. Glory to God. Man, I feel that on me like a cold, hot blanket on a Salem night. Are you with me? Now, let me read on because i got to get to this second letter because the second letter is really what I come to talk about tonight because the second letter is more important than the first in many ways. For this say we unto you by the word of the Lord. By the way, folks, he's not saying that by man's thinking. That's the word of the Lord. Let me tell you this about Paul. And what I don't finish tonight, we'll pick this up tomorrow morning. Because I may deal with this a little bit more tomorrow morning. Because I just feel this on me like a rolling river. There are some things when Paul wrote to his letters. And I'll use the marriage thing as an example. Paul was a single man. And he told the church at Corinth, he said... He said, I'm just giving you some practical advice. He said, if you can stay single and control your sex life, he said, you're better off to stay single. 
But he said, I'm not telling you this as a commandment from God. He said, I'm telling you this, that's just Paul. And I'm going to tell you what's dangerous in the body of Christ tonight. When people start start making doctrine out of their own opinion, that's when you get in a mess. And that's what people are doing. They're making doctrinal statements and claiming this is from God when it's not from God because it ain't from this book. And if it's their opinion, it ain't doctrine. If it's their opinion, that's what it is. I'm very careful. If you watch our face shows and you watch us in the morning and you watch us even, even on Wednesday nights, I always make it clear. I did this the other morning. I said, this is Chris telling you this. This ain't the Lord telling you this. This is my opinion. And Chris has an opinion. Chris's opinion is sometimes right. And 98% of the time, Chris probably messes up and doesn't get it right. Because Chris is an nincompoop sometimes. <laughs> but I try to get it right. But if I tell you it's my opinion, you need to take it as such. Because you may not have the same opinion, and we can still love each other. But if I get on that program and I say, the word of the Lord, and the Lord's telling me this, that you have to do this. Let me tell you this, neighbor. That's a dangerous ground to get on. Paul never did that. And can I tell you one thing about that? That is why Paul was trusted with the new covenant. Can you Have you ever thought about why did God trust Paul to write 13 epistles of the new covenant? That he was trusted with the most greatest message of redemption? Do you realize that everything you read in the new covenant is our salvation? This is really the fulfillment of what Christ did at the cross. The, the letters of Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Titus, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, all of these letters that Paul wrote, every single one of them, folks, look, God could have picked a myriad of, of, of people to write those letters. Why did he knock down a bigoted Pharisee? By the way, he was killing Christians. Paul wouldn't have been invited to most church conventions to speak. Paul was a murderer. But why did God choose him to entrust him with the gospel and i don't know if you know this and we're going to we're going to wrap this up in about 10 minutes and then we're going to i'll pick this up tomorrow morning because it's important and we'll we'll do we'll, we'll get everything in this weekend that i'm going to get in and what i don't get back in i'll be back in the spring and i'll pick it up part two how about that um i told the dalton people that and they didn't believe me and i did that i came back uh, two months later and we picked it up from where we left off in june um but Paul could be trusted because Paul never ever put the word of the Lord or let me change that he never put his opinion in the place of the word of the Lord he always told the church this is me speaking but when he knew it was from God when he knew it was from God he said I'm speaking to this by commandment I'm speaking to you by commandment he said that about the Lord's Supper. He said, I received from the Lord that we need to observe communion. We are to observe the Lord's Supper. When he got to the marriage thing, because Paul was single, and he said, I'm just telling you this out of my own suggestion. Stay single if you can. But he said, if you if you marry, you're not sinning. You need to marry. Can't control your sex life? You need to get a wife. Can't control your sex life? You need to get a husband. You know, that's the way it is. Um, in this case, though, in this case, when he's talking about the rapture of the church, this ain't Paul talking. <laughs> this ain't Paul talking. This is the Lord talking. That's why to deny the rapture, you deny the resurrection. To deny there's a rapture, you're denying the word of the Lord. And, and I know people ask all the time, well, what about people that don't believe in the rapture? Are they saved? I'm not going to question their salvation. I don't know, folks, but I'm going to tell you, be blunt with you folks. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you have denied the very foundational message of the resurrection. You've denied your salvation. You've denied the foundation of our salvation. Because if Christ hadn't rose from the dead, why are we here? If Christ is not living tonight, folks, if, if, if we were worshiping Buddha or we were worshiping Allah or we were worshiping Muhammad or Joseph Smith or any other leader out there tonight, if we were worshiping any religious Buddha, Hindu, well, I don't know who the Hindus worship, or whoever here, Christian or whatever, if we were worshiping any religious leader in this world, if we were worshiping the Pope, the Pope's going to die. The Pope, every religious leader is going to die. They ain't coming back out of that grave unless they're saved. I can tell you tonight, our Savior 
He's, he's sitting at the right hand of God. And I would like to believe that he's leaning over his throne tonight, listening to this gray-headed relic preach tonight, and say, tell him, McDonald, tell him. Tell him I'm alive. Tell him I'm alive. Tell him I'm alive in Salem, Massachusetts, and tell him I'm coming again tonight. Tell him I'm, tell him I'm coming soon. Glory to God tonight. Paul was saying this by the word of the Lord. Amen. And that's why you can be sure of two things, neighbor. If it's coming from God, it is true. Amen. And number two, it's going to happen Amen. just Amen. as he says it's going to happen. Yes, and man can't change that. And man can't tinker with that, even Amen. though man tries. Amen. The church can't change that, even though the church tries. Amen. Man, I feel that only like a blanket. <laughs> now, what's going to happen? I'll read it to you real quick. For we say this to the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And what he's saying there is they're going first. We're not going to prevent this if we're alive on the earth. There's going to be a twofold part of this resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. It's this, this same Jesus of Acts 1 and 11. He's coming with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Right there, folks. And folks, let me tell you this. That word in Christ, you might want to write this down, circle that in your Bibles. To me, that is the only requirement that I see in Scripture for being ready for the rapture. you got to be in Christ. Somebody said, well, what about Jesus saying you got to be accounted worthy to escape? Folks, can I ask you a question tonight? Is there any of us worthy to no. escape outside of Christ no, tonight? Worthy no. of Nobody's worthy of anything, aren't we? Die, that's it. That's a, absolutely, Mary. But in Christ, yes. Christ has made us worthy. Amen? Amen? So to be accounted worthy means to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul will go on to tell the Thessalonians in Thessalonians 5 about let us be sober, let us watch, let us be vigilant. And he's talking about the rapture, of course, but he's also talking about the fact on the earth. Let me tell you this a little bit, and we'll get into this this weekend. This is going to be the theme of the weekend. I felt it this morning. I woke up this morning, and I was really I was really blocked a little bit. I don't know why I was blocked. I, it was just like the Lord waited to the last minute. He does it sometimes like that. And I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to speak on here this weekend. But when I woke up this morning... I, uh, and that's what happened a little bit yesterday. I was listening to a book by Mark Hitchcock called The Great Apostasy, and it was really good. But I feel like this weekend I want to talk about this event and the two comings of Christ. But can I tell you that even... Let me, let, let me ask you this as we close tonight. How many out of, out of... Let's just put a percentage. How many... What percentage of this earth do you think believes Jesus is coming back tonight? Any, any, anyone want to take a guess? Just take a gander how many how many in the church let me let me just bring it down to the church how many in the church you think really believes he's coming back for them tonight i can tell you i don't believe it's less than 10 percent that a fair fair assessment i think it's a fair assessment that less than 10 percent even believe he's coming back and and even less than that believes that he's coming back anytime soon they believe that it's a way off thousands of years away a hundred years away 200 years away i don't know when it's going to be folks i don't know it may be that long but it may not be that long. Mm -hmm. But the issue is we better be ready, whether it's later, earlier, or midpoint, or wherever. We better be ready. But this is the thing. I know people have always taught this, and I've seen, you've seen the movies, you've seen the Left Behind movies and all that garbage from Tim LaHaye, and it's not garbage, but there was a lot of things in those Left Behind movies that just... We ain't got no Baptist in here, do we? Good. You got to love them Baptists. You just got to love them Baptists. Um, but let me tell you about the rapture. The way the world is tonight about the rapture, the world is going to be the same way about, about his second coming. The Antichrist is going to be so powerful, and that spirit of Antichrist that we're going to talk about tomorrow is going to be so ramped up in the tribulation that there's going to be so much deception that he is going to convince the earth that there and let me, let me before I say that let me say this you think we're going to be missed your loved ones will miss you if they're lost they will but can I tell you this 
that world out there, they ain't going to miss the church. They're going to be glad we're gone. If you don't believe me, look at your headlines. Look at the look at the lady that's running for president tonight. She's out there mocking pro lifers the other night. She said, "You're in the wrong rally." Yeah. Well, guess what? There won't be anybody in the wrong rally after the rapture. That's right. Because everybody at that rally won't be believers. They they are they are salivating for the day that the church is gone. They're going to thank God. There'd probably be some nuts on television. I got a feeling there'll be some backslidden preachers on television saying. Well, we've been wanting to get rid of these haters. We've been wanting to get rid of these people that are dividing the church. We want to get rid of these rapture folks anyway, so they're gone. Thank God we can have our utopia. But they're going to realize very quickly that it ain't a utopia that's coming on planet Earth, neighbor. But I'm going to tell you this, what's going to happen, and we're going to close on this because it's late. Listen, the Antichrist is going to convince the Earth and they're going to be just as not watching for the second physical coming of Christ no more than the church is looking for him to come tonight for the church. You follow that? We're not going to be missed. And that's why Paul was telling the church in 1 Thessalonians 5, he's dealing with the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, but do you know that the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night? I know people have taught that for years, and that's the rapture. It's actually speaking of the second coming. Both are going to come as a thief in the night. Because the earth is not going to be expecting Christ to come back no more physically than they are tonight for the church. Now, it's 844, and I promised you I'd get you out of here. I want you to uh, come back with me in the morning. We're going to pick this up. Because I want the reason I want to go on with this in the morning let me tell you what happened. And I wish I had more time tonight, but I don't. Paul laid out the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus for the church in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. Laid it out as clear as could be. Guess what happened to the Thessalonians? It wasn't, it wasn't a year after Paul wrote that letter that they got spooked. You know what they got spooked about? They thought Christ had come back and left them behind and they were living in the great tribulation we're going to talk about that tomorrow you know why they got spooked false teachers they had people that were plagiarizing Paul's name writing letters to their church there were people going there claiming they were speaking in tongues and giving interpretation of tongues and claiming it was from God. And there were even people claiming, and have you heard this? There were people claiming they were getting this revelation from angels. That an angel was telling us that Christ has come back. The Thessalonians did not believe what Paul wrote to them in the first letter. So Paul had to get his pen back down and write back a second letter. And is that not the church tonight? You know what? You want to know why Chris McDonald gets crazy. Do you want to know why Chris raises his voice? Do you know why Chris McDonald throws stuff at my camera? Do you know why Chris loses his hat sometimes and throws my hat down? Do you know why Chris acts crazy and the fool sometimes? Because no matter what I say, I still get people telling me we're in the tribulation. Folks, you know, back in COVID days, there were people that got mad with me. They left the show. They absolutely got so Oh, infuriating mad when I tried to tell them that the coconut cake shot wasn't the mark of the beast. They were convinced. They were they were pushing this that if you take that shot, the mark of the beast. You, you're we're in the tribulation. People were teaching we were in the trumpet judgments. They were teaching people we were in the seal judgments. They were teaching people that the earth was about to. I mean this, that, and the other, and it was all sorts of that. I could have saved them a lot of heartache and a lot of sleepless nights. And a lot of things, a lot of people were going through a lot of anxiety because it was right here in the Word of God that none of that's true. And Paul is going to give you the timetable tomorrow of when the Antichrist is going to be revealed, when the church is going to be taken out, and I'm going to destroy a misunderstanding tomorrow, and I want you to come and be with me and hear this tonight. Go home and chew on this tonight. The Holy Spirit 
will never be taken from this earth. I'm just curious. How many of you ever heard that before? That the Holy Spirit's going to be taken when the rapture comes? I'm going to tell you. We're going to, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. He's not going to be taken from this earth. And I'll tell you why. There are going to be people that are going to be saved in the tribulation. The 144,000 are going to be saved in the tribulation. There's going to be miracles of God. Fire being called down from heaven by these witnesses. By the way, these 144,000 Jews, they're not the Jehovah Witness. Let me tell that. That's my second medal of the night. <laughs> Can I tell you what they're going to be? They're going to be prophesying, tongue-talking Jews that are going to be walking this earth. Can you imagine? You're talking about people laying hands on you and seeing miracles. This bunch is going to be spirit-filled to the hilt. So if they are spirit filled, where's the whole where where's what spirit are they being filled with? The same Holy Spirit that you and I are filled with tonight. That should let us know He's not going anywhere. And folks, the Holy Spirit has been on this earth. He's God. Are we in agreement with that tonight? And if He is God, to say the Holy Spirit's going to be taken from this earth, you gotta say God's gonna be taken from this earth. And I don't care how bad the tribulation gets. As I stand up and tell you goodnight and we're going to pray together, can I tell you something? Satan, even in the tribulation, is on a leash. If you think, Salem, this, this city, these people that are worshiping the devil and blatantly thinking that they've got things under control and they're controlling this city, can I tell you something? The devil can have his heyday all he wants to. God they can, he cannot do anything. Satan cannot do anything except God allows him to do it. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. And especially when it comes to you, child of God. Now that world out there that don't know God is at the devil's whim. But when it comes to God's people, and when it comes to national Israel, and it comes to end time events, even with the end time event that's coming, Satan and the Antichrist are on a leash. And whatever they do, they're being allowed to do it by God. That's another message. Another time. Did you get something out of this tonight? Amen. All right. Any questions real quick? Any questions? I knew Mary was going to... We're going to leave right now. Listen, 10 o'clock in the morning, please be back. You don't want to miss part two of this because the second letter in many ways is more important than even the first because what he has to do in that second letter, he has to correct false doctrine. And we're going to talk about some of the false doctrines that are out there about the rapture. And the Bible is as clear as night as day as to how and what's coming. Let me say this as you get out of here tonight, folks. God's not scared of dates. God's not scared of setting dates. Mm -hmm. God sets dates all the time. Where we get messed up is we set our own dates. Mm -hmm. And we concentrate on the dates instead of concentrating on God. Mm -hmm. We need to let God worry about the dates. Mm -hmm. God's got a timetable for everything. He's coming back. He's coming back. Jesus is coming. That's what I came up here to tell Salem. Yes. What I came up here to tell you this weekend. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Yes. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this beautiful group that's here tonight. We pray your blessings. On us, Father, we'll be back here in the morning doing it again. Thank you for bringing these folks back safely, getting them home safely tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen. May the Lord bless you all out there. I'm going to play a song going out. And uh, we'll see you back here in the morning at 10, right here on the Mac Falls Faith Network. Be blessed. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. Well, Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. Good morning, Sister Mary. Good morning, Brother John. Well, I want to stop and talk with you. want to tell you how I come along. I know you've heard about Joshua. He was the son of none. 
He never stopped his work until, until his work was done. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. You may talk about the men of Gideon, you may brag about your king of Saul, but there's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Up to the walls of Jericho they march with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle's in my hand. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. You may talk about the men of Gideon, you may brag about your king of Saul, but there's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Well, they tell the great God that Joshua's spear was well nigh twelve feet long, and upon his hip was a double-edged sword, and his mouth was a gospel horn. Yet bold and brave he stood, salvation in his hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the devil can't do you no harm. God knows that Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. Up to the walls of Jericho, he marched with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle's in my hand. Then the lamb ram sheep horns begin to blow, the trumpets begin to sound. Old Joshua shouted, glory, and the walls came tumbling down. Josh fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh fit the battle of Jericho.